Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. I got this email from Mark Harris. Subject line, Satan approaches Logan Temple. And uh, we did a video about that story. It's the first link that he included in this email. Uh, if you missed that, I'll put a link for it in the description box below. It's this video right here. We reported the incident at the temple to the president of the church. Uh, it is well worth watching, I promise you. Uh, all this is part of this project that I'm doing where I have this spreadsheet. It's called Timeline Visions and Visitations, where I'm attempting to collect every account uh, that can be found about a visitation or vision uh, or dream or near-death experience having to do with heavenly messengers. Um, and so this is all in timeline order. Uh, I've done quite a bit so far. It feels like it's been a lot, but I, I know that it's incomplete. And here's the latest entry that we're going to talk about right now. So let me find it again. Okay, it's right here. Uh, this one's a vision. So he provided me with this second link. And that takes you to an LDS Living article, A Nighttime Visit from a Spirit, an Uplifting Story from President Packer. And uh, this is actually not what we're going to cover in this video. This will be in another video. But as I started to look into this, um, it guided me to this book by Boyd K. Packer, The Holy Temple, that uh, contains that story. And as I, as I was looking through this, I came across another one. So I want to cover that one first before... I do another video about the one that the uh, LDS Living article was about. Okay. Okay. So um, we're going to be going over this and an associated, uh, basically, well, basically it was a near death experience that is similar, something that we've already covered before, but it'd be great to review. I notice a similarity between this new story that I have not covered before and then the old story that I already had. And the old story is not yet on my spreadsheet, so it's good to cover it again. Okay, so this one, uh, it's unknown uh, when this took place, but this was told in the October uh, 1908 General Conference by Roger Clausen, who uh, at the time was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. So he's the one telling the story, and he said it was some years some years ago. So don't know exactly when it happened. So that's why in column E, I have unknown, but this was a vision. Uh, I don't even know the name of the person that this happened to because he didn't say it, but a really interesting thing is said. Okay. So here we are. This is, um, this is conference report. So this is where general conference uh, was recorded, um, before the modern, you know, church magazines and internet and stuff. Okay, so Elder Clausen says, Some years ago, a brother approached me and he said, Brother Clausen, I am 67 years of age. I've been a strong and active man in my life and have done a great deal of hard work. But now I'm somewhat feeble. I cannot engage in manual labor as heretofore. How shall I spend my time? And I said to him, Go to the house of the Lord. Thank you, he replied. I will take your counsel. So it was just as easy as that. I can't work anymore. What do I do? Go to the temple. Okay, thank you. About eight years later, I met this brother again. He appeared to be very happy indeed, and there was an expression of joy in his countenance. Brother Clausen, he said, during the past eight years, I've been working for my ancestors in the house of the Lord. After that conversation with you, I went east and I gathered up 800 names of my relatives. And during the past eight years, I've personally officiated for 300 of my ancestors. And I uh, propose to continue on with the good work. I'm happy for the Lord has blessed me. He further said, and, and here it is right here. Okay, this is where we start getting into uh, what I want to have on my spreadsheet. I saw in vision upon one occasion, my father and mother, who were not members of the church, who had not received the gospel in life. Uh, and I discovered that they were living separate and apart in the spirit world. And when I asked them uh, how it was that they, were, that they were so, my father said, this is an enforced separation, and you are the only individual that can bring us together. Uh, you can do this work. Will you do it? So this is really interesting. Keep, bear in mind, 
this story is being told by an apostle in General Conference in 1908. Um, so this is a really just kind of interesting detail about the spirit world. And it's this part right here, uh, the enforcement of separation, that made me think of the second story that we're going to cover, which was a near-death experience that uh, had to do with the spirit world, because there was like a similar uh, situation that's related in that story. So, you know, because th that's like another thing. I <laughs> I may have to like, um, yeah, I think I probably will. On my quotes A through, A through Z spreadsheet, I think I already have an entry for spirit world, but I think it'd be interesting to collect all these like just little tidbits of information. So the situation here, his parents were not members of the church. And so in the spirit world, uh, they were separated. And we don't have much more detail than that, like how that took place or what that looks like. But all we know is that they were, it was an enforced separation, quote unquote. And uh, that's sad. That's not, that's not a situation that we want to be in. Okay. Uh, continuing. So uh, you can do this work. Will you do it? Meaning that he should go into the house of the Lord and there officiate for his parents who were dead. And by the ordinance of sealing, bring them together and unite them in the family relation beyond the veil. And he informed me that he had attended to the work and I rejoiced with him and congratulated him. Just now, I'm going to read this next part just because I think it's good. Um, it's not directly related to what we, to the uh, vision. Just now, at the beginning of this meeting, I went down into the audience, and a brother reached out his hand, a brother 80 years of age and upwards, I think. I judged from his appearance. He shook my hand, and I recognized him as a man uh, who had been much in the temple here. And I said to the party sitting next to him, this is a temple man. And the brother spoke up and said, yes, Brother Clausen, I have officiated in the temple for 1,200 souls. Then I turned again to the party next to him and said, Our brother here may pass through life unnoticed. He may attract but little attention. But I tell you, he will be a big man in the other world. He will be an important character there because it will be known of him, it will be known of him and will be said of him that he turned the key of life and salvation for 1,200 souls. And I submit to you, my brethren and sisters, is it not a mighty work? And are not his last days better than his first days? So I just really like that. And, and that's something that I've wondered myself. Um, as I was like waiting to go on my mission. Okay, so before I got endowed, sorry, this is just a little, just, just a little bit, okay. Um, I didn't have much going on between the time I graduated high school till the time that I went on my mission. So as I waited and before my endowment, I went to the temple quite a bit. I did lots of baptisms for the dead. And I was like, because I was going like uh, every day for a while there to, to like a different temple, taking tracks and, you know, public tra transportation. Um, and I had that thought, you know, after after I got in doubt, I, I went and did endowments, but I couldn't do as many as like when I was doing baptisms because you do a lot of baptisms in a row. And I was just thinking like, my gosh, it's going to be incredible to meet these people afterwards, the ones that it, that were worthy and accepted the baptism um, cause I, I feel like I've done a lot. So not that we're doing it for like praise or for attention, but it, it will be very validating, uh, after this life, uh, when you see these people and, um, you can take a healthy pride in knowing that you did something really good, something of the utmost importance. So, okay. So we'll move on from here. So yeah, this was, again, this was, um, told in the October 1908 General Conference uh, by Elder Roger Clausen. And now we're going to move forward just a little bit to um, January 20th, 1920. I don't have all the details here yet because I, I just figured, you know what, I might as well just read this during the video and then afterwards I'll, I'll get it all down and fill in the rest of this stuff. But so here we go. Uh, 1920. And this is the only one that I have so far for the 1920s. Okay. So we are going to be talking about, um, well, first I already, like I said, I already did a video about this, uh, five months ago. <laughs> it does not feel like it's only been five months. It feels like I did this like a year ago, like a full 12 months or more ago. 
time has been really weird for me lately, you guys. Um, but it's right here. But we're we're just gonna cover it over again in this video. Okay, so if you go to BY, BYU Library Special Collections, uh, it has an entry for uh, Heber Quincy Hale. Okay, he was born in Idaho, and uh, he had this experience at the time he was uh, president of the Boise Stake. Okay, so the stake president for the Boise Stake, this was January 20th, 1920, according to, to this um, biographical history right here. Uh, this is him right here. I was like looking for a picture, see if there was anything. So this came up, Heber Quincy Hale. This is what he looked like. Okay, and uh, this is uh, this is in the BYU Idaho uh, website or like on their website. A heavenly manif manifestation, Heber Heber Q. Oh my gosh, Heber Q. Hale, president of the Boise Stake, Idaho. I'm just gonna read the whole thing. Um. It's not like really long. I just want to remind myself of everything that happened. There were a lot of incredible things in this, as you're about to see. Okay, with humble and grateful heart, I try upon request to report a personal experience, which is very sacred to me. I must necessarily be brief. <laughs> is it necessary? Does it have to be? Okay, it's fine. Certain things were also manifested to me, which I do not wish to report, as I do not feel to tell them here. Uh, for preface, I will remark, remark that I was alone in a room of my friend W.F. Rawson in Cary, Idaho, in the night of January 20th, 1920. At the same, uh, in that same night, between 12 and 7.30 o'clock, the following glorious manifestation was given me. I will remark yet that I, was at, I absolutely cannot remember more than the experience I received in this manifestation. No noise disturbed me the whole night. Neither had I changed my position in bed, uh, which is very unusual to me. Oh, okay. So I guess it was, I guess I was thinking it was a near death experience. Look, it's been like five months going on six months. Give me a break. Okay. Whether it is to be a pilgrimage of my spirit or to be called a dream an appearance or a vision, I do not know. Uh, I don't worry about it. Well, let me just say here, as we've been doing this uh, spreadsheet, there's been a number of times, just like just like it's recorded in the scriptures, that you have people nowadays that have these experiences and they don't know if they're in or out of the body. Um, Wilford Woodruff uh, talked about that, how uh, he had a vision similar to Paul and he couldn't tell if he was in or out of the body or what was going on. So it seems like something similar is going on here. One thing I know... Uh, that what I have seen in this heavenly manifestation is as sure a certainty for me as every other experience in my life. For me, at least, it uh, is this enough. All of the doctrines and ordinances of the Church of Jesus Christ was was the vicarious work for the dead, the hardest for me to understand, although I accepted it willingly. I admit that this vision was the Lord's answer upon the prayer of my soul about this and certain other questions. I went only a short distance from my body through a veil of mists into the spirit world. Uh, this was my first perception after I had fallen asleep. To me, it was indeed as if I had gone through the change called death. Maybe this is why I thought it was like a near-death experience. And I remarked this also at once to the heavenly beings uh, with whom I came in contact. At once I could, I could perceive that these beings did not like the use of the word death. And... Uh, the fear we have of it, and express their displeasure about it. They use another word in relation to the change from this into that world. I, however, cannot remember, sorry, I cannot remember the word, and can only call the nearest meaning a new, a new birth, uh, as the impression of my mind manifests, manifests it me. So that's an interesting detail. They have some other word, uh, for death. They don't like us using the word death. That's really neat. My first observable impression was the near relation between the spirit world and earthly world. The vast greatness of the heavenly existence was confusing for the eyes of a novice like myself. Many enjoyed unlimited and unhindered action. 
Okay, now here's the, I think this, this is like the part here that I find similar to what we just read. Many enjoyed unlimited and unhindered action, while others, again, were limited in this respect. The plant world and landscape was undescribably glorious. Uh, not everything green, like here, but golden, with numerous pale red shadows, uh, orange and lavender colored, uh, like the rainbow colors. So he's talking about like the shadows with numerous pale red shadows. Okay, everything was penetrated with a wonderful stillness. The men and women I met, I did not regard as spirits, but as men and women, uh, self-thinking and self-acting persons who followed their important business according to order. Perfect order reigned and everyone had something to do and seemed to care for his own business. That the inhabitants of the spirit world were divided in classes according to their lives and the will of the Father uh, was at once visible. The repentless and wicked were separated in another district whose boundaries were unpassable like the boundaries between the natural and spirit world. Uh, they remain they remain there so long until the same have changed. So th it's this right here. This is what made me think, or this is what I was reminded of when I was reading uh, this whole thing here, where he he met his uh, father, and he's like, "Well, we're it's in what's he say again? This is an enforced separation, and you are the only individual that can bring us together." So, an enforced separation. It's I don't know. It's just. I see that uh, similarity in these stories. Uh, and he's saying that like the difference or the boundary is like the same boundary that there is between us living in mortality and the spirit world. So it's like, it's like a very real, um, something that you cannot cross uh, unless you're allowed to do so. Okay. This spirit world is the temporary abode of all the spirits until the day of resurrection of the dead on the last judgment within the different divisions or spheres reigned an active spirit ambassadors equipped with authority uh, were seen who came from higher to lower spheres in observance of their missionary destinations. I entertained a great desire to meet, especially my relatives and friends, but got at once the impression that I had entered a great and extended world greater than our earth and inhabited more numerously. Uh, I can only be at one place at a time, could only do one thing at a at a time. It could only look in one direction at a time. According to it, it would take several years to find those whom I knew and I wished to talk to, except they were especially called to receive me. All worthy men and women were called to do special and regular service after a plan of work laid down, especially... Uh, especially were they destined to preach the gospel to the unconverted and to impart to others the understanding referring to the gathering of their genealogies on earth for them. Uh, the respective proxies of these families have entrance uh, to our temple records and are perfectly informed about the work which is done in the temples. The vicarious work on earth is, how, is however, not effective in the next world. Okay, what? The vicarious work on earth is, however, not effective in the next world. The receiver must must first... But Okay, yeah. The receiver must first believe and repent and accept baptism and confirmation, after which particular ordinances are performed, which have a, a saving effect upon um, the being born again. In this way, the great work goes forward. So, see... And I think I noticed this, noticed this last time. It's almost like there's some other ordinance that takes place over there, which uh, allows them to accept the ordinances done on their behalf in mortality. And, and that makes sense to me. It's like, it's like the, the, there's like a necessity of like that kind of like an in-between thing where it's like, okay, the work's been done for you. Um, you know, they, they did all the stuff that they needed to do. It's ready to go, but here we need you to, you know, formally accept it uh, through this ordinance, what, whatever that ordinance is, or ordinances if there's more than just one. Okay, these spirits do work which cannot be done here, 
and we perform works which cannot be done there. Both are necessary and supply one another in this way. In this way, the salvation of men uh, that want to be saved is accomplished. I was surprised not to find any little children. I met the little son of Orson, at Orson W. Rawlings, uh, my first counselor. At once I knew him as the son of the above named who died some years ago, and yet he seemed to uh, have the knowledge and especially the appearance of a grown-up. That's another detail. And we've heard this a number of other times that your spirit does not look like what your age is. It's, it's essentially like a, like a full grown mature in its prime adult, essentially. Okay. He was occupied in the affairs of his family relative to the genealogy. I am perfectly convinced that mothers get the opportunity to again, take their, their, little dead children into their arms. But the fact remains that the entrance into the world of spirits is no stop of growing in that we have the greatest opportunity for development there. Children are grown up spirits in infant bodies. And that's another thing. If you go to my quotes, A through Z spreadsheet, when it, um, I think it's under children, uh, millennium, or it could be under millennium children. Uh, All the Joseph Smiths, Joseph Smith, Junior, you know, Joe Smith, um, who saw God the Father and Jesus Christ, him, Joseph F. Smith, and Joseph Fielding Smith, and others have confirmed that that is the case. You get to raise your children that die prematurely in the millennium. All right, continuing. So on I saw a great multitude of men, the greatest I ever saw gathered at one place, which I at once uh, recognized as soldiers. Millions they were who were murdered cruelly and driven into the world of spirits through the great world war. In the midst of the great multitude uh, moved a great general, quietly and majestic. When I came near, the mild smile and welcome of the much beloved man greeted me. It was Richard W. Young. And uh, I had looked him up before in the other video. Here he is. Uh, This is, let's see. He was a U.S. Army Brigadier General, or in other words, like a one-star general, uh, <clears throat> in an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the Philippines during the time that the Philippines was a U.S. territory. So here he is right here. That's who he saw. It was Richard W. Young. Then the positive conviction entered my soul that none was endowed so perfectly for this great mission for which he was called than exactly him. He stirs up at once the attention and esteem of the soldiers, a great general and high priest of God. No earthly field of action for which he could be destined can be equaled in importance and and extension, as with what uh, he has to do now. Later on, I heard that General Young had organized this vast army of men perfectly with officers over divisions uh, succeeding one another. All were seated and were preached in He preached to them the gospel with great earnestness and conviction. As I went farther forward, I met also my beloved mother. She greeted me lovingly and expressed her surprise to see me there, uh, told me, however, that I had not yet fulfilled my uh, given mission on earth. She seemed to be in a hurry to go somewhere. uh, Therefore, she took leave of me or from me with the remark that she would see me again soon. I went farther and went a great distance for which I used much time. I saw the most wonderful landscapes, parks, trees, and flowers. Many people I met, of whom I knew some, but many thousands did not number uh, to my acquaintance circle. Now, I approached a little group of men who stood in a wide street, which was lined with flowers, lawns, and shrubberies of golden tints, and which led to a magnificent building. This one group of men was engaged in earnest conversation. One of them separated from them and came to meet me. At once I recognized him, uh, recognized in him my esteemed President Joseph F. Smith. He embraced me like a father his son. After he had greeted me, he, sorry, remarked, uh, you have not come to stay, which, I, which uh, remark I understood more as an enlightenment than a question. 
For the first time, I was perfectly conscious that my earthly mission was unfinished, and although I should gladly have stayed, I asked President, President Smith if I was permitted to return. You have a righteous desire, he said. I shall confer with the authority about this matter and give you an, an answer later. We turned and I accompanied him to the little group of men uh, from whom he had come. I, I, at once, I recognized President Brigham Young and the Prophet Joseph Smith. I was surprised to find in the former a more undersized, heavy-built man than I, I always had imagined. That's interesting. More undersized, heavy-built man. So also with the latter, I found him taller and more stately than I expected. Both of them, as also President Joseph F. Smith, possessed a mild in esteem, commanding highness, which worked both kindly and impressively. President Smith introduced me to the others who greeted me kindly. We then turned our steps back. President Smith took leave and said he would see me again. From a certain point uh, there on the other side, I was permitted to see the earth and what happened there. To my horizon, no, boundary, no boundaries were set, which amazed me. Which I, I don't know what that looks like. To my horizon, no boundaries were set. Uh, what does that mean? Does it mean like, you know, you have the phrase like, um, as far as the eye can see, like, could he see further than what you could typically see here on earth? Because I may, maybe your vision is like better there or what does that mean? I don't know. I saw president Heber J. Grant at the head of the great church and kingdom of God. Uh, I felt the wonderful power, which proceeds from God and directs the destination or yeah, and directs the destinations. I saw that this nation, USA, was founded on true principles, constitution, and is destined to hold out, although possessed with evil and priestcraft, which try to lead men astray, to hinder the purposes of God. I saw cities and villages and the sins and wickedness of men. I saw sailing ships on the oceans and perceived the battlefields of France and Belgium. To be short, I perceived the whole world which lay before my eyes like a passing panorama you know sorry here it goes again uh david b hate elder david b hate of the quorum of the 12 i think it was like in 1982 i'm not sure he had a near-death experience and he told uh pretty much the whole thing in general conference there's probably some details that he withheld but he also described seeing a panorama but in his case he was viewing the savior's life but he saw it kind of like a a panorama, if I remember right. We'll probably be covering that pretty soon in the near future. Okay. Then I obtained the convincing impression that the view of the earth and men on it was open only for the vision of the spirit when special permission for it is given them or when the same are destined to certain services on it. Uh, this is chiefly the case with the righteous souls who are occupied in the service of God who cannot occupy themselves uh, with twofold things at the same time. The wicked and unconverted spirits have always have always their free will yet as formerly, but they do not use the same for a wise investigation of the plan of salvation, but seek pleasure in their old in their old camp and rejoice in the sins of a wretched and hopeless humanity. In this relation, they are always yet the tool of Satan. Uh, it is these idle, wretched, and evil spirits that perform the miserable falsifications in spiritual sittings, moving of tables, etc. The noble and great spirits do not answer the call of a medium or of any group of curious, meddling investigators. The good spirits did not do it in mortality, and therefore will certainly not do it in their growing knowledge in immortality. Only the evil and unconverted spirits as allies with Satan and his army work through the willing mediums in flesh. These three powers constitute the, un the unholy trinity of Satan and are responsible for all sins, wickedness, distress, and misery among men and nations. Gosh, so, you guys, so much detail. So much detail. The fact that you have like this, like, um this like view of the earth that's like not always available. It's only available when it's like needed. Uh, you have this idea of 
these like spirits that not like Satan's followers from the pre-mortal life, but people that are just wicked that are in the spirit world that, um, yeah, they do answer the call of, you know, these people that dabble in these type of things. That's why, you, that's why you need to stay away. Uh, me too, all of us, we all need to stay away from that kind of stuff. People that, that are interested in those things and, and do strange things that are associated with magic and, and spirits and stuff like that. Cause you do not know who's showing up and you might have somebody that seems really nice and they, they, uh, claim that they have like a special ability or they can see into the spirit world or whatever. And, uh, maybe they do, but who they're contacting and what they're seeing is not good. And so you get mixed up in that and you're meddling with evil spirits, uh, in the spirit world or evil spirits from the pre-mortal world or life. Just let's not, let's not play around with that. Okay. I went farther and my eyes, my eyes delighted on all the wonders, all the wonders which surrounded me. I enjoyed the undescribable peace and happiness, which reigned everywhere. The farther I went, the more glorious things appeared. While I stood on, on a certain favorable point, I perceived in a short distance for myself a wonderful and beautiful temple, the towers of which were covered with gold, uh, out of which came a group of men in white garments and conversing stride along. Um, in conversing stride along. These were the first I saw clothed thus. The millions which I saw before were fully clothed, but in a different way. The soldiers, for example, were in uniform. Uh, in the little group of men, my eyes perceived one special high and holy man, more prominent than all the others. While I gazed, while I gazed astonished at him, President Smith, leaving the others, came to me and asked, do you know him? I answered quickly, oh, I know him. Uh, my eyes see my Lord and Savior. It is true, President Smith said. My soul was penetrated by an enraptured and an unspeakable joy filled, sorry, was penetrated by an un enraptured and an unspeakable joy filled my heart. President Smith then informed me that permission was given that I could return to fulfill my mission on this earth for which the Lord has chosen me. President Smith then laid his hand on my shoulder and said the following remarkable words. Brother Heber, you have a great work to do. Go forward with a prayerful heart and you'll be blessed in your service. From now on, you will doubt no more that God lives and Jesus Christ is his son, the savior of the world, and that the Holy Ghost is a God of the spirit an ambassador of the Father and the Son. Never doubt the resurrection of the dead, the immortality of the souls, that the destination of men is an, inter is an eternal progress. Never doubt again that the mission of the Latter-day Saints is to bring the gospel to all mankind, living or dead, and that this great work, the salvation of the dead in holy temples, has just begun. He assured that Joseph Smith... Sorry, be assured that Joseph Smith was sent by God to bring the gospel in the fullness of time, and that for the last time on earth, sorry, and that for the last time on earth, his successors were all called of God. Heber J. Grant is at this time the acknowledged and ordained head of the church of Jesus Christ here on this earth. Give him your confidence and support. Uh, much you have seen and heard, uh, which you are not permitted to publish when you return to the earth. And gosh, I wish we were privy to that, but I, I'm sure we'll find out after this life. Uh, this saying he, okay, this saying he bade me farewell and God bless you. A wonderful testimony. I went back a long distance through different regions and passing many people before I got back to the place at which I had entered the spirit world on my way. Many of my friends greeted me. Some of them sent greetings and exhortations to their loved ones uh, my mother was one of them. Another thing uh, I will mention, I met namely brother John Adamson, his wife, his son James, and daughter Isabella. All were killed at their home in Cary, Idaho by the hands of uh, impious assassins on the evening of October 29th, 1915. Uh, these these anticipate okay, these anticipated that I was on my way back to mortality. And Brother Adamson 
asked me to execute the following message. Tell our children that we are very happy and very much occupied, that they shall not mourn over their over our departure. They shall also not worry about the manner and nature in which we have in which we were taken from the earth. There was a purpose in it, and we have work to do here, which claims our united exertion, and which work cannot be done by one ind- individual of us. Again, that's similar to uh, this whole thing with Brother Raskelly. Uh, it's a it's another vision uh, that we've covered before, where there was like a priesthood council. They needed some more priesthood on that side of the veil for for some purpose, and they were considering three names. And uh, so Brother Raskelly, he was like really sick, and he was he was visited by one of them, and had an interview, and he was like, well no, I can see that you're still really needed here. There's people that really need you. So we're not, we're not going to take you. And then, and then two other guys that he knew died, they they were taken to the other side of the veil because they needed them. So here you have like a whole family or the better part of a family that was taken because they were needed over there. It's probably something that we should think about with anyone that we lose. Uh, It's always going to be a sad thing from our point of view in this world but it's probably because, uh, well, I'm sure a lot of the times it's because uh, they're actually needed over there. And there's just this, there's this order to things. Okay. So anyway, continuing. Um, I was at once given information that the mentioned work was the finding of the genealogy record for which they endeavored in England and Scotland. One of the greatest and most sacred matters of heaven is the family relation, the establishment of a perfect chain without any broken links bring, uh, brings perfect joy. Very bad members are left out and either new members take their place or the adjoining members are forged together. And by the way, there's going to be a lot of this going on in the millennium. The millennium is where all these things are going to be worked out to where we have that what I refer to as a final family because we're all mixed together, all the different people living all the different laws. But when it comes down to it, when it comes to the social kingdom and exaltation, um, it's gonna, only going to be those that were worthy of exaltation. And so there's going to be all these fixes that are going to be made. Okay. So very bad members are left out and either new members take their place or the adjoining members are forged together. All over through the world, men and women are influenced to gather genealogy records from their departed ancestors. These are the links of the chains. The ordinances of baptism and sealing, which are performed in the temples of God by the living for the dead, are the forging of the links. Ordinances are performed in the spirit world, effective upon the personal receiver of the saving principles of the gospel, which are vicariously performed on earth. When I arrived near the entrance, my attention was turned to some some little groups of women who seemed who seemed to prepare clothing. Observing the inquiring expression of my face, one of the women said, "We are preparing to receive Brother Philip Worthington very soon." Uh, Philip Worthington died January twenty second, nineteen twenty. So this was like two days later. Uh, of which incident, Brother Hale was advised by wire. And went back to Boise and uh, preached the funeral service January 25th. When I repeated, when I repeated astonished Worthington's name, I was surprised to hear the following. If you knew what joy and a glorious mission awaits him here, you would not wish to hold him back on earth any longer. Then the truth came to my knowledge that only the will of the Lord can be done on earth as in heaven if we conform ourselves perfectly to his will and that this will is done in and through ourselves. Because of the selfishness of men in their personal will against the will of God, many persons who otherwise would have been taken away in peace and innocence have obtained permission to live um, and they have lived a, a suffering and miserable existence through temptation, uh, treaded the road of crime. Men, women, and children are often called to great and important missions on the other side. Some answer with joy, others refuse to go, or their loved ones who do not give them up. 
Others leave this mortality without any special manifestation of the divine will. If a man is sick, uh, the first important question should be, will he live or die? What does it avail uh, whether he lives or dies as long as the will of the Father is done? Certainly we can commit we can commit him to God wherein he li- wherein lies the special duty and privilege of the laying on of hands of the holy priesthood. To the elders of the church of Jesus Christ it is given to let the will of the Father work, of the Heavenly Father work. If for any reason the called elders are unable to comprehend the will of the Father, uh, they should continue to pray in faith and humbly submit to the Lord that his will be done as it is performed in heaven. For the righteous, it is a privilege and blessing to be born into the spirit world. The greatest spirits of the Father's family have generally no permission to live in the flesh longer than until they have fulfilled the special mission. That's really interesting. The greatest spirits of the Father's family have generally no permission to live in the flesh longer than until they have fulfilled the special purpose or special mission. Then they are called in the spirit world where, where the field is greater and there are fewer laborers. Jeez Louise. This earthly mission may therefore uh, be longer short, just as the father decides it. We went calmly out of the spirit world on the spot where I had entered and directly my body was uh, enlivened and I arose reflecting over the many wonderful things to write them down. I herewith publish to the world, not minding what others say or think, that I know by my own positive knowledge and my own experience that God is the father of the spirits of men and that he lives, that Jesus Christ is his son and the savior of the world, that the spirit of man does not die, but goes through a change, the so-called death, quote unquote, and goes into the world of the spirits and that this spirit world is near or even on this earth. That the personality of man is not lost through death, nor is his progress prevented. That is, the spirits literally take up again their bodies in the resurrection. That the principles of salvation are, are now taught to the spirits that, that the great work of the salvation is performed now among the Father's family, uh, whether living or dead, and proportionally few are lost at least, or few are lost at last. Uh The gospel of Jesus Christ has been found again on this earth with all the keys and power, authority and blessings through the cooperation of the prophet Joseph Smith, that this is the power which saves and elevates not alone uh, those that yield obedience, but also saves, but saves also the world at last. Uh, That the task of our mission is to save souls and that the work of salvation for the dead is not less than the work for the living. And that's it. So it, it's it's incredible stuff. It all makes sense. I'm not sure that I've ever seen any other account, report, uh, vision, anything as detailed as this one about the spirit world. And it, this is something I'm going to have to come back to you time and time again. Um, it's not like everything that's said here is not doctrine per se but it, i don't think that the church has like distanced itself from it i mean you know it, it's record it's it's been kept it's been recorded and kept at byu idaho at least on this website there may be more to it but i i believe this account um i guess we'll see for ourselves whenever our time comes hopefully the second coming comes and uh None of us go to the spirit world. We'll just be changed in the twinkling of an eye uh, from mortality to being resurrected. But it's just fascinating stuff. But yeah, the two the two similarities is this idea of like confinement, separation uh, when it comes to the wicked or those that have not yet received the gospel. There's there's an enforced um, separation. So. Okay, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.